I'll do a little self-introduction, but uh, part of the, the joy of doing this is that I've been uh, a topography addict for an awfully long time. I had a mentor by the name of, of Lenny Bronstein who encouraged me to get a Kara instrument. It was, seemed to me it was in the 70s, and uh, from that point when the Placido Technologies came about in, in the early 90s, I consulted for Tomei and then for Alcon and Daikon. Um, so I had the pleasure of enjoying um, topography in my practice. And um, through topography, I discovered my, uh, my own keratoconus, uh, uh, which then further motivated me to be, motivated me to be interested um, in helping other people. The, um, we'll see, uh, there we go. A couple of purposes here. Uh, one of them is, and I'll state it in one of my slides, that I believe that the number one problem facing the specialty lens industry today is returns, remakes, and exchanges. Um, and I believe this comes about because of our history in fitting contact lenses as, art, as an art, that we felt it, we could get the sense of what we needed to do, um, and we thought more in uh, quality, sort of the, a, a general amount of change that was required in the lens uh, versus um, an actual numerical amount. And so my belief is, that's good enough, okay. my belief is that measurement is the first step to modulation and that what we should really be doing to avoid those remakes, exchanges, and returns is um, measure twice and cut once. And it, it's interesting to me that as I listen to the different Grand Rounds presentations, one of the things you hear in almost all of them is, well, then I saw this and I ordered this, and then I saw that and I ordered that. And by the time you're finished, you've got six lenses, seven lenses that were ordered for a successful fit. And that's not pleasurable for the lab who's, by our policies in our industry, uh, made decisions to make exchanges quite easily for you. It's not convenient for you as a practitioner to eat up your chair time. And it's, you know, when we see that, and on their sixth visit, <laughs> Um, they were finally happy and looking pretty good. Uh, and the truth is that we can measure. And I've been fortunate uh, through the last, since about 2009, that I had the opportunity to have a prototype in instrument of what is the Eaglet Eye today. And uh, with a sample of about 135 patients, I was able to have mean eye information, standard deviations, and um, I was able to learn the circumferential elevation differences of the mean eye. And that allowed me to utilize the technology for designing a number of lenses. Um, and we'll be talking about some of those. But in terms of my, my journey, I was 26 years in private practice. The last 21 years, um, I've been involved in product development. Through that, uh, filed a number of patents and continue to patent in the area. And in fact, Paragon CRT was developed right off of topography. Uh, we've developed two scleral lenses, one primarily for the military, uh, and then another one that uh, uh, will hopefully soon be seen by you, um, that were all driven by the uh, topography measurements that we had from fringe topography back in the early days. But also the lens for the contact lens enabled wearable display, uh, which is a novel soft lens, was developed off of the Eaglet Eye technology and is in clinical trials now. Um, and we uh, also the telescopic lens, the, which is an 18-2 diameter scleral lens, was developed off of the uh, data from the Eaglet Eye. So we've, we've had a, um, a long history there, and I do have uh, involvement in the industry um, that I'll disclose to you, although since this is not CE, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot, um, but I really enjoyed um, the experience of being a product developer. The, um, and I have no financial interest in Eaglet Eye, I just really like it a lot. So, uh, But as I said there, the, the need to move from art to science. Uh, one of the things we've done in contact lenses is often had too many moving parts. It's like playing golf. <laughs> um, we had too many parts we could move in the lens, and we were trying to move them at too small an increment. Um, and without necessarily driving them by uh, measurement. And so part of the answer is create the, the zones that need to be changed in the lens, create a rational increment that you change them, and then have some measurement basis for why you change them. 
The, um, the, the other thing we've come out of is this, the notion and this, the wonderful, fortuitous uh, fact that, that one size fits all lenses do pretty darn well. And they do well mostly because of material science, that we, if we have a low enough modulus and a proper thickness profile, that the lenses are able to circumferentially stretch in the periphery when you have a, a larger or eye, a shallower eye, and they are able to gather to some degree on a, on a deeper eye and get away with it. But the industry that we're all in is those eyes that just can't be fit uh, with a commodity lens. And it's kind of probably silly for us to work too hard at trying to replace the commodity lenses that are low cost and easy to access and, and uh, easy to fit by our 12 year old, 12 year old children. Uh, but there are plenty of eyes that uh, can't be fit with those lenses. And in many cases, those are made with materials that have high expansion factors uh, when manufactured. So they tend to be manufactured uh, thicker than we like once they expand. They don't have the modulus that really allows for this forgiving nature. Um, and so we have to be better in our assessment. So these instruments, the Eaglet Eye has a, a great application in your custom soft lens fitting as well. Um, and kind of a primary thought about scleral lenses, and I love where we're going and we have many great teachers in scleral lenses, but so much of the early emphasis was constantly pointing you to the cornea and corneal clearance and limbal clearance, but it's a scleral contact lens. It contacts the sclera. The sclera is what you're fitting. How can you fit it if you can't measure it? You need a means of measuring the sclera so that you know how to modulate the scleral zone. Um, and the clearance inside of it becomes a rather trivial matter. But we t t tend to go inside out instead of outside in. Um, so Certainly, I'm a strong emphasizer of the importance of measuring the sclera. Fit the sclera and get your clearance second. You can't measure the sclera with a diagnostic lens if it doesn't have clearance to start with, though, by the way. <laughs> so that's why some of our good teachers, like Chris Sin and, and Miro Sharnak, they'll say, just put a lens on. Just put any lens on. <laughs> get a lens on. And once you have clearance, now maybe you can look at the sclera. But you can't if you don't know what the lens is. So that's really another problem we have, that manufacturers need to tell us the dimensions of every zone in the lens. If you don't know the width of the zone, and you don't know the depth of the zone, how are you going to modulate that? Like, I'm really big on smart doctors, not so much smart lenses <laughs> or smart curves. I, if we have the joystick, because we know what the lens is, then we're going to do a lot of good. So we all know the history that keratometry is, and topography, they have limitations when it comes to ocular contour outside of maybe 10 millimeters. That extrapolation, I've studied the geometry of the eye quite a bit, and the R squared values of trying to predict scleral elevation by the last data point on a topographer that's at 9.5 millimeters is nonsense. You can't do it. The, and I'll show you why in a minute. So for us to understand contour and design requirements, measurement's the first step to modulation. Discover the eye shape. Simplify the design variables, which companies are doing quite well with. The next step is they need to tell us what they are. Um, and then create novel features that utilize um, this advanced, um, that can use, uh, utilize our advanced manufacturing to tailor to what we've measured. Um, we'll talk more about soft lenses if we get there, but uh, this meeting is really about scleral, so we're going uh, to go there. But what we did back in 2009 was we took those data from 135 eyes, and we um, felt that we had an adequate sample. And it is, again, what is now the equal eye that you're able to get yourselves, and we've been using it for designing lenses. The next step is your use of it for fitting lenses. That, you know, how then can we take what we've learned in design and transfer it to daily fitting? And while I put this on a Basanti picture, what we did is took every 60 microns uh, out to 15.5 in cord dimensions, and we measured the sag of this population of eyes, and we came up with the mean eye 
right and left of those 135 eyes. And that's what I've used to make the center point of every lens I've made. Um, but then we also know the standard deviation. And the main thing I want to point out to you is that inside of, let's say, and I'll give you some points. This is um, 9 millimeters, we'll say. Um, this is 12 millimeters. This is a chord of, of 14. In, at the chord of 14, you have over a two millimeter difference in elevation from the shallowest eye to the deepest eye. And it's amazing that one size fits all can do as well as it does if you have a sizable difference over the total population of two millimeters. It's not even close. Um, but we, we know it's kind of, to some degree why that works. But through studying those data, we also looked at if I was going to land on the sclera and respect the sclera, what was the best geometry to have out there? And if we blow it up and the screen's got some wrinkles in it, but if I use the standard concave to the eye curve, that by the time I'm landing, there's natural impingement at the edge. If I flatten that outer radius, to raise this, I lower it here. So I'm either going to have contact at the origin of that last curve, or I'm going to have contact at the edge. It can't have it any other way. If I make it tangent, the same is true. Tangential landing can't work on the majority of eyes. So we discovered the need to have a convex to the eye curve, and then control it by an angle. And really, that's that contour-based design to have a kind, gentle landing but keep in mind that's only in one meridian, or one semi-meridian, that we need to know that that eye circumferentially, and again, the emphasis is on elevation, not angle. That the first thing we need to know is the elevation difference circumferentially. So that came to the notion of the, the angle, uh, the peripheral sag control, where you take an outer zone and control it by an angle. Um, and then if you add to that a convex to the eye curve controlled by an angle, you now have the ability to be friendly to the sclera all the way around. You need to know what the depth is at the key point, and the key point tends to be the middle of that convex to the eye landing zone, not the edge. That that's your point, what I call your tangential touch diameter. And every design that uses either convex to the eye or tangent still has a tangential touch diameter that is a, what I call the node or the control point that that design is aiming at. So again, the manufacturer must disclose all zone dimensions, zone width, zone depth. And when I listen to presenters and they talk about, well, I did this and I did that, it's clear that they didn't know what the lens was. And a system that requires you to constantly talk to a consultant is a doomed system. We're too busy today. Some of us who love it, where it's our hobby, hobby business, it's not bad. But sooner or later, success breeds a situation where you can't ask all the time. You don't have the time to get on the phone and listen and then look and listen and look. Or ask them to fix a lens. <coughs> oh, that lens almost worked. It's not quite right. Let's order another one. It's, not a, it's a dysfunctional system. So elevation is the destination, and if I could just have a mantra that everyone would say after the presentation, it would be elevation is the destination. Geometry is just how you get there. I need to know the elevation of the eye and the elevation of the lens so that I can make a match. So let's suppose we design the super duper sclerol lens, it's a 16-4, and we label it as a 9-0 optic zone, and then it and this is something that I was talking with Joe Barr about this morning and, and Jenny Folk, that what are we going to call this next zone? And then what are we going to call this zone? And what are we going to call this zone? And does the industry need a standard? Or if I just love certain words, so I call mine one thing and you call yours another thing and, and we have battle. You know, should we be calling our zones the same thing? But let's suppose we call this a peripheral corneal zone. We call this a limbal zone, and we call this a scleral zone. Or we can put other words in it, but we do that. But when we do, we have control points. And we have a control point at the optic zone junction. <coughs> we have a control point at the peripheral corneal landing limbal zone junction. We have a control point at the scleral zone junction. 
And if you know where those flow control points are, if you're given some values to look at, then you can go to the eye surface profiler and you can put the core length in and it will give you what the, the sag of the eye is at that cord circumferentially or you can look at it nasal and temporal. And what I tend to do to determine an eye if 14.0 was my <coughs> key point, I would take the two of these and average them and that would be, let's say, that eye sag. But remember, we aren't fitting that, we're fitting it plus clearance. So you can end up labeling every eye by what it dement sag is at your key cord, your tangential touch cord, plus your preferred pre-compression clearance. And you can have labeled that eye, that eye will never be any different than from that. You need to make sure that the sum of all your zones add up to that. Uh, and you'll be a, a happy person ever after. And so, uh, thanks to a, a doctor in Germany, uh, used the, recently used the eye surface profiler I gave for our super duper lens. I gave him the key cords. Um, and he measured 25 right eyes and left eyes, and we came up with the mean sag at those key control points. And if 14.6 was my tangential touch point, and I personally like 250 microns pre-compression, then I would add 250 to this, and I would get about 36.75. That's a 36.75i today, tomorrow, and forever. The question is, how do I get all the components of my lens to add up to that? And the final thing here is that the sclera, sclera is toric, and I use the, that word toric because is it a torus? I don't know if it's a torus, but as a rule. And what we found in those early data was that there was a 300 micron elevation difference from the highest point to the lowest point, mean, and the standard deviation was such that by the time your six standard deviations out, you just about get to spherical on the least different side. So a dual elevation lens is a rule, not an exception to the rule. That means that if we're fitting lenses that don't have any toric periphery or dual axis or dual elevation, that we have a lot of eyes that are being fit um, that don't spread the weight they don't give you circumferential equivalent landing, and so we're going to have hot spots. Um, and we need to respect that. So again, elevation is the destination. Uh, geometry is just how you get there. So my suggestion is determine, often the horizontal meridian is the shallowest, just like with the rule. Um, so determine your angle in the shallow meridian and try to have some basis for determining how much dual elevation feature you want in the lens for the deep meridian. And I generally suggest that diagnostic fitting sets be made in dual elevation rather than make them what I call omni, you know, the same all the way around. Okay, so fitting the sclera, uh, determine the optimum landing zone angle or landing zone depth or sag or whatever, however the manufacturer determines it. Do it by using eaglet eye at that key cord. The lab has to tell you what the key cord is. <laughs> you put it in, you look at your elevation difference. Um, and then look at the difference between the shallow and the deep on the eaglet eye or um, by diagnostic lens. But I will say that because the deeper meridian in the sclera is often superior nasal, uh, but superior is, is common that there's a need to retract lids sometimes. You need a good way of retracting so that you can get all the data in a reliable way. Further, you tend to get sometimes a tear meniscus that will uh, distort your data. So if you can get some retraction to get better measurements, that's a good idea. Okay, I'm gonna stop there because the time's up. Yeah, okay, perfect, yeah.